Good evening, everyone. We're delighted that you're here at our 53rd annual conference and we'll have our welcome by Drs. Corey Gooding and Dr. Davin Phoenix. Hello everyone, uh, from wherever you're joining us, we're grateful to have you all here at this award ceremony. So I am Davin Phoenix, Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of California, Irvine. And I am going to kick it to my esteemed co-chair, uh, Corey Gooding, to introduce himself and share a little bit about the theme for this conference and our vision for this award ceremony. Thank you, Davin. Uh, my name is Corey Charles Gooding. I'm Assistant Professor of Political Science at the University of San Diego. Uh, it is our honor to welcome you to the 2022 award ceremony for the National Conference of Black Political Scientists. This year's meeting centers visions of Black futures at the crossroads. The metaphor of crossroads suggests that there is not a single juncture, but indeed there are many. There are many opportunities to envision and enact new futures inspired by the struggle for liberation. There are also many classic and emerging challenges to those visions of Black future, which force us to reimagine our praxis and gather in community to meet the moment with the urgency it demands. We want to briefly fix our gauge on a few of these challenges before highlighting some of the ways that our NCOPE's community is advancing work and leading efforts to guide Black folks through these crossroads and into a brighter future. We want to stand with our African kin who live and study in Ukraine who are seeking reprieve from the war inflicted upon them but are encountering, encountering wave upon wave of anti-Black refusal and neglect. And we acknowledge and affirm WNBA player Brittany Griner who is enduring unjust treatment and detainment in Russia. We recognize these instances of anti-Blackness in Europe. And we also want to recognize the anti-Blackness visited upon Black immigrants attempting to enact their own liberatory futures in the U.S., within this country, and at our U.S. border. As state legislatures develop new technologies to police the bodies of women and members of the LGBT community, we are crudely aware that these new iterations and efforts to police the body politic are persistently practiced most aggressively and violently on Black communities. We see the constraints being imposed on educators and students in school systems across the U.S. as state legislatures impose bans on critical race theory or, more accurately, bans on a true accounting of history and governance in the classroom. Historically, Black colleges and universities face bomb threats from those attempting to terrorize our communities. And this is occurring alongside enduring underfunding of these institutions, which enacts to quote our president and executive director, a particular kind of economic violence against institutions of higher education. Looming under the specter of January 6, 2021, we note the continued efforts to suppress the black vote and manipulate election outcomes through a variety of methods ranging from the overt to the surreptitious, such as restrictive ID requirements, voter roll purges, shutting down polling places, and gerrymandering. Yet despite these rugged and obstacle-riddled crossroads, NCOPE's members dare to envision, investigate, and enact liberatory black futures. We recognize the innovative research that examines how movements within and beyond borders assert that all Black lives matter, from India to Japan, Sudan to Nigeria, and from Brazil to Baltimore. We're grateful for the research inquiries presented at this very meeting into the ways that Black women shape politics across the diaspora. We salute the advocacy and community building of the LGBT caucus. And we acknowledge the generative reflections from this meeting on the work of C. Riley Snorton on the intersection of race and sexuality. We recognize the liberatory educational practices that inspire new Black futures by developing innovative tools and approaches to countering white supremacy within educational institutions. We appreciate the faculty members who are introducing undergraduate and graduate students to NCOPES for the first time. We also recognize our most junior attendees, including our junior resident, and the children and family members who are asking questions and dropping in to share in this empowering community. We see NCOPES members continue to offer authoritative voices on Black voting from so many angles, from the Black Girls Vote organization to rigorous analyses of Black voting behavior, mobilization of Black constituencies, and how Black people evaluate candidates, platforms, and regimes. We acknowledge the engagement of NCOPES members 
whose training and activism have produced substantial changes in the redrawing of congressional districts across the country, therefore improving the voting power and representation of Black communities. Tonight, we're excited to, excited to celebrate our own. Uh, we extend recognition to people who enrich the community of Black political scientists and Black folks at large through your scholarship, your teaching, your mentoring, your service, and your advocacy. The people we honor with these awards are leveraging their wisdom and their energy to bring us closer to a vision of the future in which we are free to teach how we want, ask the questions we want, be political in the ways that we want, love how we want, and live how we want. And even as we acknowledge these outstanding community members, we are all too familiar with the fact that NCOPES is made possible because of each of you. It's possible because you are willing to commit your time, your energy, your passion, and even donate your hard earned money to building and moving this community forward. And for that, we are truly grateful. With that, we want to turn it over to an NCOPES leader, mentor, scholar, uh, and our president. Dr. Tiffany willoughby Harar. Thank you, friends. Um, I hope my volume is OK. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we Not can. Not too loud. OK, great. I have the wonderful uh, privilege and honor to invite the ancestors in and to bring in the people that we have lost and that we remember and cherish um, dearly. So in honor of our ancestors, I ask us all to humble our hearts and humble our heads and um, take a moment of silence. And then the next voice you'll hear is my own um, in prayer, which is an incredibly vulnerable place to be in a public space. But I offer it to each of you um, because it is my most vulnerable place and because we need for the work that we do here to be assisted by the world of the invisible the world of the immaterial, the things that are not human, but that work in concert with us and for our good. Please join me in a moment of prayer. Mother, Father, God, creator of all things, we humbly approach the altar, asking only for the opportunity to draw near. Allow us to draw near to our history. Allow us to draw near to the people so courageous to have built this space for us and imagined us more than 50 years ago. Each of us lives in a place that is not our own. We are not the first people in the places that we live. And yet we still have a chance to breathe and be safe in those places. Thank you for the mercy and grace of just being able to be. Mother, Father, God, you know the depths of hunger, the depths of desire, the depths of, of loss, the depths of tragedy, the depths of suffering and you are our constant and always comforter. Thank you for the delight of seeing our students come forward and really honestly, truthfully, courageously be in their voice. Thank you for the honor of our scholars understanding themselves as the intellectual arm of the revolution. Thank you for us learning how to actually bear our true selves with each other because we cannot enter that next world that is eager to be upon us without doing that work. Thank you for the disagreements. Thank you for the moments when we have to struggle toward each other and choose to fight with each other. Thank you for every single hand that offered some kind of assistance to sustain this organization this year. Thank you for every single heart that said yes to a request. Thank you for every strong boundary. And we simply ask, we simply ask for the honor to be able to move this organization forward and to carry the blessing of this space into the next era. We are at a crossroads, but we are not alone. We are at a crossroads, but we are not alone. 
Thank you for being with us. Thank you for guiding our people in ages past. And may our efforts be to your glory. Amen. And now in our program, we are moving on. Thank you all for uh, being here tonight. You see my screen is doing all kinds of things. That's okay. We now have the introduction of our keynote speaker by our local area planning committee members, Dr. Tamlin Tucker-Wargs and Jasmine Noel Yarish. Thank you, Sister President. On behalf of my co-chair, Dr. Jasmine Yarish, and myself, I'm so pleased to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Maya Rockymore Cummings. Dr. Rocky Moore Cummings is a non-resident senior fellow at Brookings Metro and the founder, president, and CEO of Global Policy Solutions. She's the author of the forthcoming book, Rageism, Racism, Ageism, and the Quest for Liberation Policy. A wealth, health, and education equity expert, Dr. Rocky Moore Cummings has conducted extensive research and policy analysis on aging, social security, the social determinants of health, and the racial wealth and achievement gaps. A frequent guest on prominent television and radio news shows, Dr. Rocky Moore Cummings has appeared on CNN, MSNBC, BET, BBC, among many other national and international outlets. She's also testified before the U.S. House of Representatives, the Senate, the U.S. Senate, and the Democratic National Committee. Her articles, letters to the editor, and quotes have appeared in the Washington Post, the New York Times, and the Baltimore Sun, among many other news outlets. Dr. Rocky Moore Cummings has worked as Vice President for Programs and Research at the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, professional staff on the Social Security Subcommittee of the House and Ways and Means Committee, chief of staff for former Congressman Charlie Rangel, and senior resident scholar for health and income security at the National Urban League's think tank. She earned her PhD and master's degree in political science with an emphasis on public policy from Purdue University and her bachelor's degree in political science and mass communication from Prairie View A&M University. She's taught at American University's Women in Politics Institute and served as an Eastern Regional Panelist for the White House Fellowship Program. Dr. Rocky Moore Cummings has chaired several boards, such as the National Association of Counties Financial Services Corporation, and has been a member of many organizations, such as the American Public Health Association, the Association for Public Policy Analysis and Management, the American Political Science Association, and was a founding member of the Council of Urban Professionals and the Experts of Color Network. The recipient of many honors and awards, Dr. Rocky Moore Cummings has been selected as an Aspen Institute Henry Crown Fellow, a Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Fellow, and a Woodrow Wilson Public Policy and International Affairs Fellow. Most importantly, Maya Rocky Moore Cummings is INCOPE's own. Her scholarship, her policy work, and her political work are inspiring to all who know her. Over the course of this year's conference, we've had tributes and panels honoring one of our foremothers and ancestors, Dr. Jewel Prestige. Well, Maya was a student of Dr. Prestige, Prestige and is one of Jules' jewels, and is among those who best exemplifies Dr. Prestige's legacy. Therefore, we are so pleased to welcome Dr. Maya Rocky Moore Cummings to speak to us today. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It is my distinct honor uh, and pleasure uh, to be before the National Conference of Black Political Scientists. Once again, uh, it was, I think, 1990 uh, was my first NCOX meeting. And I can't remember if it was Oakland or Jackson, Mississippi, but I do remember this. We had a lot of fun. It was wonderful being a student uh, and coming to NCOPE's meetings to not only fellowship uh, with you know, other students who are being 
uh, basically brought to uh, the conference by other professors across the country. But to listen to the greats, you know, certainly I had exposure to Jewel Prestige. She was my mentor and professor, Matt Jones, founding uh, member of NCOPES, uh, and certainly uh, an intellectual giant on his own. Uh, but to hear, you know, Ron Walters and uh, Haynes Walton and all of these greats, uh, you know, uh, Professor Smith, who had written all these great books and had given us their intellect and insight, uh, certainly into this American project we call the United States of America, uh, was inspirational beyond belief. I think it set a foundation for my own intellectual development that was critically important, as important, I think, uh, as the, uh, the foundation that was laid uh, by my professors at Prairie View. Uh, and so with that, I have a lot to be grateful for uh, and NCOPES is one of them. And I have a lot to be grateful for, for those who have continued the traditions of ensuring certainly the intellectual rigor of the NCOPES con con conferences, uh, but also the continuance of the organization uh, that it may grow and expand to be what it needs to be uh, in this era of certainly uh, our lived experience. Davin and Corey, that was a fabulous, fabulous, fabulous introduction uh, to this, uh, basically this dinner. And I just wanna say congratulations to you all for just laying it out there. You're absolutely correct uh, that all of the issues that you laid out, all of the uh, crossroads, if you will, uh, are incredibly, uh, certainly important uh, at this moment in time. Uh, and I think that you are very articulate uh, in terms of how you, how you laid it out. So thank you. Tiffany, President Tiffany Willow be heard. I just wanna say thank you. Thank you, thank you for that prayer. What a beautiful prayer and certainly inspirational one. Uh, certainly one that we need to continue to preach and reflect on. Uh, as we seek to actually grow stronger, uh, what, which is what we're going to need to uh, be able to do uh, as we march into this future and our futures, if you will. And then Jasmine and Tamalyn, I just wanna say thank you to the local logistics committee who reached out to me uh, to ask me to be a keynote speaker. Imagine that, a student uh, who used to tag along with her professors to come to NCOPES now actually being a keynote speaker at an income conference. And I am actually very appreciative of the invitation uh, and certainly say thank you very much. So, I mean, tonight's discussion is about visions of Black futures at a crossroads. Visions of Black futures at a crossroads. Now, it's been at least 30 years that I've been hearing about Afrofuturism and knowing that there were online forums, you know, back in the 1990s, where people who had visions of Black futures, uh, many of them, uh, certainly, uh, you know, um, authors and artists uh, and, you know, uh, people who were thinking about uh, the future, even back then, of course, uh, and we can talk about traditions that go and expand even beyond the 30 years, uh, because I do believe that all of the scholarship uh, that we have produced as a people, and when I say as a people, I mean uh, across continents, I mean, uh, you know, Afro descendants uh, and people uh, living uh, on the continent itself, envisioning a future for our possibilities, our possibilities of prosperity, our possibilities for a quality lived experience, our possibilities for power, our possibilities for purpose. That has always, I think, animated the, the, the scholarship uh, of you know, people uh, like Matt, like Ron, like Haynes, like Jewel, who knew that what we faced, certainly in the context of the United States of America, certainly in the context of the oppression you know, uh, associated with slavery and uh, certainly mercantilism and all of the things that have, uh, you know, uh, colonialism, all of the things that have oppressed our potential as a global people that we have continued to fight through despite the odds, 
despite going through all kinds of terrible circumstances, we have continued to plow forward into a future. Now, I've got to tell you that I, you know, I had a little chuckle because as you well know, Kanye West <laughs> has been talking about black futures lately. And I was just like, okay, had he been, uh, you know, has he been uh, 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 speaking to the organizers of, uh, uh, of NCOPES uh, about the theme, uh, but I do think that this is catching on, that we don't need to be talking about, certainly, we all need to be talking about the past and what, uh, uh, what was spoken about earlier with regards to um, uh, critical race theory and the effort to actually erase the past is critically important. Uh, and we also, of course, need to also focus on the present, but focusing on the future gives us an opportunity to set that vision for where we want to be and then set the strategies for how we get there. Now, you know, I, I took note of the fact that future is not singular, it's actually plural. Uh, and I think that's absolutely correct too, because as you well know, we all live at the intersection of different uh, identities and realities. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, is that all of them, I think, uh, are interconnected and can be brought into uh, dialogue with each other in a way uh, that can yield a future uh, that is positive. So with that, I want to talk a little bit about Ukraine. Why am I starting with Ukraine? Because what's happening now, what's happening right now, I think, with the, uh, with the, um, the basically launch of this war in the Ukraine, is the effort of China and Russia to actually join hands. They've been meeting, uh, Putin and Xi have been meeting uh, for at least the last 10 years uh, to talk about how to actually construct an alternative world order uh, where they have their own economic systems, uh, where they have their own uh, you know, uh, power structure, where they have their own mode of productions uh, and certainly their own allies. I think that they have been plotting and planning a strategy uh, to actually break from uh, the uh, American uh, United States hegem hegemony, uh, to actually lead the, the world away from a unipolar world uh, into a multipolar world. Uh, where they actually control a significant block of how the world operates. And so, you know, why uh, is this important? Uh, you know, will Blacks fare any better in a multipolar world? Uh, and I've got to tell you that if we're looking at a future uh, where the West is de-emphasized and there all are alternatives, you know, perhaps, you know, a, a, a Sino-Russian, uh, you know, uh, uh, block, uh, that controls a significant portion of how the world operates, will Black people fare better in that alternate world? And I've got to tell you that both systems are racist. Both systems would be anti-Black. Both systems, I think, would be willing to exploit racism and use racist practices uh, for political economic gain. And why do we know this? Why do we know this? Why do we know this? because we know uh, that Putin and to a lesser extent China have been intent on actually leveraging uh, the division of race in this country as a way to actually uh, cleave, uh, you know, exploit the cleavages in this country and the divisions uh, and to weaken the United States uh, for their, uh, you know, their grand global purposes of, you know, having a rising East. Uh, so, you know, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that whether it's the West uh, who's leading and in control of a globe, uh, a global world order, or if it's the East, uh, I don't think, and by the way, when I first came to Washington, one of the, uh, the, the, um, the first bills that I worked on was the African Glo uh, Growth and Opportunity Act. Uh, it was the first ever multilateral uh, trade agreement between the United States of America and countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I worked on the House Ways and Means Committee where I started that work. And then when I moved to become Chief of Staff for former Congressman Charlie Rangel, I continued it. Uh, it passed, it became the law of the land. Uh, and certainly there have been all kinds of 
uh, you know, um, I don't know, it's been 20 years. Uh, and certainly there have been outputs from that that have, I think, transitioned uh, and transformed uh, certainly um, opportunities on the continent and here in the United States for businesses. Uh, and what we do know is that the United States has lost a lot of leverage uh, with countries in Sub-Saharan Africa as China has sought to form alliances and certainly has uh, had, you know, diplomacy uh, in the terms of, in terms of reaching out to build and construct and to form uh, other arrangements with countries of Sub-Saharan Africa. But we know in that context that in no time have they been, uh, you know, kind of forward thinking about, for example, technology transfer. Uh, they have imported their own employees, their own Chinese employees. Uh, they have stood apart uh, from people in those sub-Saharan African countries, even as they built, you know, roads and bridges and other things. So we know that they have a worldview that is anti-Black as well. Uh, and so with that, I think that we, under, we should understand uh, that, you know, the difference is not much. But the rationale for actually uh, having this uh, uh, notion and this conversation in this point in time is a, a very important because what we are facing right here in the United States, I think, is our zero moment. This is a moment where we either sink or we swim as a nation. And what am I talking about? Prior to uh, 2016, the New York Times ran a series of articles uh, where they talked about the changing face of America, uh, where they highlighted studies. Uh, some of them have been done by political scientists uh, asking white Americans what they thought about the Census Bureau projections showing that by the year 2042, 2043, the United States would be uh, basically majority minority, quote unquote. And I was fascinated to read the series uh, because you know what they were doing was uplifting the fact that white people were scared. White people are scared. Now, do I mean all white people? Are all white people threatened by a future of a black planet? Uh, no, but a certain segment and certainly a large segment of white people here in America absolutely are fearful of a society where they can no longer, you know, certainly uh, claim uh, majority status. And in their minds, the notion of perhaps, uh, you know, losing privilege uh, losing the ability to rig an entire society in ways that completely benefit them and their networks and their families for generations. Losing the ability to actually have economic dominance and political dominance and cultural dominance. Losing that scares them to death, literally. Uh, and so with that, you know, what we have here, and by the way, one of those studies read, and the article read, that when whites are presented with the data about the shifting demographics of the United States of America, it's not just the right-wing conservatives who move further right, it's moderates and liberals too. They all move to the right. And so uh, with that, you know, folks are scared. Uh, and so with that, you know, lo and behold, we get Trump. Now, when Trump won, I mean, I got to tell you, I felt like I woke up uh, in 1942 America that, you know, it was almost like, you know, that we were in, uh, you know, uh, a bad episode of the Twilight Zone uh, that, you know, we had been taken back uh, so many years and certainly his rhetoric matched that, uh, you know, here was a man who touted uh, the fact that, you know, who needed to be politically correct uh, he touted his sexism, he touted his racism, he basically encouraged, and I argue he opened the Pandora's box of hate. Uh, I think a Pandora's box that had been slightly closed as a result of the civil rights movement and women's rights movements, uh, but certainly uh, he opened them back and the doors were uh, basically um, spread wide open for all of the people who had been sitting on the sidelines who basically held these same old beliefs 
uh, coming out into the forefront and basically feeling free, if free as a bird, to state their beliefs and to act on them. So, you know, with that, we got Donald Trump. And uh, Donald Trump's administration, as you well know, uh, was highly corrupt, uh, very racist. Uh, and, uh, you know, when I say corrupt, I don't mean just corrupt in terms of, you know, uh, subverting our democracy and undermining uh, our agencies and, you know, using the power of the office uh, in bad ways. I mean corrupt in terms of mafia style corruption. Now, many of you all know that when I left uh, Prairie View, I went to Purdue uh, to get my PhD. And then I came to Washington DC in 1997 to collect data from my dissertation. Uh, one of the first people who gave me an interview for my dissertation was the late Honorable Elijah Cummings. Uh, you know, we met each other, we became friends. Uh, eventually, uh, you know, that friendship morphed into a romance, and then we got married in 2008. And when uh, Trump uh, came into office, you know, Elijah was privileged to actually become uh, the chairman of the House committee that actually oversees all of the investigations of uh, the Trump White House and the agencies of the executive branch. Uh, and, you know, um, unfortunately, uh, with that came all kinds of intimidation. Uh, and I'll never forget, I was sitting right here in the room that I'm sitting here talking to you from to, uh, today uh, uh, in this house. Uh, when about 2.30 a.m. in the morning, uh, one evening, um, you know, Elijah calls me and I actually was upstairs, he was down here. He calls me and he yells, "My somebody's in the house, they, they come inside uh, the vestibule and come into the house. And so I rush out into the hallway and there's this man and he's a black man, looked well-dressed He's pulling a bicycle out of our vestibule and then leaving and he, he ends up riding off down the street. Now, you know, we would have thought that this might have been an ordinary break in if five hours later, Donald Trump didn't start uh, basically tweeting about how Elijah was a terrible congressman, how Baltimore was infested with rats and rodents and how you know, it was terrible and everyone was corrupt and people were stealing money and this and that. Uh, we don't think it was a coincidence. And we know uh, based upon, you know, um, the attack that it came with all kinds of death threats. It came with all kinds of, this was no ordinary Republican president. And he led a movement that was no ordinary right wing movement that we have known of. Uh, it is a corrupt movement. I think one that is so uh, emboldened and so fearful of a uh, majority minority quote unquote nation. And I don't like the term majority minority, uh, but you know, certainly a diverse uh, and uh, uh, cult uh, culturally multicultural democracy uh, that they have been willing to overturn democracy itself, subvert the rule of law, certainly ignore democratic norms and absolutely uh, trample over the constitution uh, in pursuit of power that will allow them to basically do what they want. And we know what they want. They wanna use violence. They wanna use corruption. They wanna use repression. They wanna use voter suppression to basically turn back the hands of time and put us back in a position uh, where we are uh, certainly um, unable to, uh, I think, carry out our fullest aspirations in this on this land. In, in this land, uh, I think that they are threatened by the level of African American and other Black progress that they've seen. They were certainly scared um, to death uh, by the rise of Barack Obama. Uh, and so with that, you know, we know uh, that they uh, are willing to basically play the role uh, that the South played in the Civil War. This faction that has now, I think, consumed one of the two major political parties in the United States of America uh, is seeking uh, to have control and power uh, to not just turn back Black opportunities, 
but uh, certainly opportunities for women uh, to control their bodies, uh, to actually continue uh, in terms of self-determining their futures. Uh, certainly they have an agenda for LG uh, LGBTQ uh, and transgendered, certainly uh, you know, what's happening in the battles in Texas and in Florida, I think are uh, opening many eyes about the nature of the oppression that they that they uh, that they envision, uh, certainly they have even turned on. Certainly, uh, anti-Semitism has been a part of their strategy. Uh, you know, certainly uh, Islamophobia has been a part of their strategy. And if you look at Donald Trump, ableism has been a part of their strategy. Their strategy, simply put, is to actually enact a vision of society where they can continue to have patriarchal control uh, over um, basically all other groups uh, in a way that suppresses and oppresses and turns back the hand of time. So the question for us becomes, can democracy, can democracy itself deliver broadly and generally for the United States and for black people especially? And I would argue that, you know, if we give up this uh, form of governance, which of course has not worked perfectly, but has allowed people like Elijah, who grew up in the Jim Crow South, uh, you know, who, you know, was able to participate in the civil rights movement here in Baltimore, integrating a local white pool, uh, and certainly uh, as, a, as a 11 year old child, uh, and then taking advantage of Brown versus Board of Education and the brief period of integration, uh, true integration that we had here in Baltimore uh, to you know, uh, attend schools um, that allowed him to elevate and become a leader at uh, Howard University, to become one of the earliest cohorts of lawyers to graduate from the University of Maryland Law School. Uh, to go on to, you know, become uh, the first ever uh, Black Speaker Pro Tem of the Maryland State House of Delegates and certainly a leader in the United States Congress, being a, a, a chair of the Congressional Black Caucus and also a chair of a powerful committee. Can democracy uh, deliver for Black people? I think that at a point in time it has delivered for some, but we absolutely have to be about making it deliver for everybody. And so, yes, it can, but only if we fight for it, only if we fight for it and claim it. There is no other form of government, in my opinion. Well, maybe there are other forms, but we have to envision it. Uh, and that means that, um, you know, uh, working to uh, claim a future where we have voice, where we have agency, where we have self-determination. And for me, I always talk about it in these terms. I call it an inclusion revolution. Now, you know, some of you might be thinking, okay, you know, we've been in this country how many years? 16, 19? Uh, and, you know, certainly the country has not been kind to us, uh, but we have continued to plow forward and to find a way, find any way uh, to make a better future for ourselves. And I think that, you know, arguably you can point to progress. You can also point to some things that are the same that they've ever been. But, you know, we're not talking about um, necessarily uh, a return to, um, you know, uh, a mass exodus from the United States uh, to go to live in countries in Sub-Saharan Africa or anywhere else for that matter. Although I know that, you know, some people, uh, black people have chosen to leave. They chose to leave in 2016. Uh, and some might even choose to leave, you know, in 2024, depending on what happens. But I got to tell you this, that, you know, the project of the United States of America, as my good friend Angela Rye says, we built this shit. <laughs> and so uh, the fact of the matter is, is that we've got blood, sweat, and tears that run all through the rivers and on the soil of this land and we've got to claim it. And so for me, the inclusion revolution means a future where coalitions and alliances matter. If we're looking at a society where people who have previously been oppressed are rising to become the majority, 
then there is no room to replicate discrimination. And certainly people who have been discriminated against should not be discriminating against others. So, you know, finding common cause, not just with other people of color, not just with white people who are aligned uh, and believe uh, in a multicultural future, but certainly with all oppressed people and having allies across the board. And I'm talking about a, a, through sexual, all of the intersections, sexuality, a religion. I'm talking about race, ethnicity, gender. Uh, I'm talking about it all that we need to form common cause with everyone that they are battling because only then I think do we get the critical mass that we need to form the coalitions that we need to forge forward uh, to a future where the possibilities are ours and they're self-determined. We know that in this uh, way uh, and towards this goal that politics matter. I think that we need to bum rush the system, all aspects of the system of every level of government. We're not playing the game at every level of government in the way that we need to, the electoral branch, the legislative branch, the judicial branch. We need to have widespread political participation with our young people trained to rise up to take positions of power. We need to be playing the state game at a different level. We need to be playing uh, the school board game at a different level. We need to be playing on all cylinders. So, you know, at a time where we see uh, Republicans in red states who are enacting all kinds of voter suppression laws, who are acting and enacting, you know, even uh, laws where they can go in and uh, preempt and uh, basically votes uh, in certain counties that are black led, like in Georgia. We see Latasha Browns. We see Stacey Abrams. We see bad black men and women who are stepping up to say, no, you will not. Who are not just stepping up in an advocacy sense, but who are also stepping up into elected uh, roles and, and challenging the electoral pow power and leveraging the electoral system, even as we continue to coalesce and build power outside of the system through Black Lives Matter and, and by, <laughs> By the way, uh, you know, I certainly uh, was pleased to see somebody whom I met at Incopes, my God, 30 years ago uh, and had lunch with just last week. Uh, and I am so pleased uh, that building power outside of this system does not mean that we have to give up power inside this system. Uh, Dr. Melina Abdullah out of Los Angeles, who is actually now in a, a national leadership role in the Black Lives uh, Matter movement. You know, certainly, and she is a product of NCOPES as well. Uh, and so certainly, you know, we have, uh, you know, an inside outside game that we've got to bring up to a new level. And that means that we're paying attention to how we train our young people uh, to come up. And I would argue that policy matters. Liberation policy matters. And what do I mean? As many of you know, I came to Washington and you know, while my PhD was in political science, we were actually required to have three areas of specialty at Purdue. Uh, and I chose international relations, I chose American politics, and I chose public policy. And oftentimes as political scientists, we think about you know, the politics of a situation but as you well know, the spoils of politics is policy. The ability to set the rules, the ability to determine the substance of, of how people's lives are uh, you know, uh, you know, controlled, uh, the ability to determine who gets what, when, and how, uh, certainly the ability to determine resources, all lies in the land of public policy. Uh, and I've got to tell you that I've been on the forefront of a number of public policy battles, and it's all in the details. You know, Social Security was an issue that I've, I've fought for, you know, and, and the reason why, I mean, you know, people of color, you know, we don't have, we don't have retirement security. Uh, we don't have the luxury of not having uh, a safety net uh, if a parent dies and leaves dependent beh dependents behind. Uh, we don't have the luxury. We are disproportionately among those who are disabled. 
Uh, and so we don't have the luxury of not having a system of disability pay that allows people to get payments when they run into retirement uh, or death of a loved one, breadwinner, or you know, a disability. Uh, and so that means that social security is incredibly important to us. And yet several years ago, uh, you know, the right wingers uh, were intent on privatizing the system. Uh, and you know, what we had to do was do the scholarship and the research and, and the analysis to show that it was a racist policy, to show that it was a sexist policy. And to make those arguments on a national stage, we were able to beat a sitting president of the United States of America in 2004 when Bush argued that he was going to actually privatize the system. It didn't happen. Why? Because we fought. But we need new policy warriors. Warriors. We need young people who are trained in the public policy arts, who know how to analyze it by race, ethnicity, by gender, by class. We need more policy experts and we need to focus on the policy in addition to the politics. Uh, but I won't go on because I'm about to close to say that worldview matters. Now on social security, I first started uh, when I, uh, my first job on the Hill uh, was working on the House Ways and Means Committee, Social Security Subcommittee, which is, and I was my, it was my responsibility to build the left wing coalition that was gonna battle the right wingers who are trying to privatize the system. Uh, and at the time I didn't know that it would lead to this grand battle four years later when Bush won a second term. Uh, but you know, I gotta tell you, we fought hard against George Bush and then we fought hard to make sure that Barack Obama won. Thinking that, okay, uh, a democratic president is gonna make a, a big difference and not, not only a democratic president, but the first African-American democratic president is gonna make a big difference. Uh, but you know, in the area and the space of social security, to be frank with you, we had to battle the Obama administration. Uh, and this was largely behind the scenes but you know, some of the things that they were proposing, they were proposing to give the right wingers some of the things that we had been fighting against uh, around you know, the social security program. And so you know, it was tough actually having to turn and battle one of your own and not just one of your own, but you know, certainly uh, an African-American, the first African-American president of the United States. So I just wanna say that worldview also matters that you know that we've got to be about the business of not just cultivating leaders who are black and brown but cultivating leaders who have a sense of responsibility to black and brown communities cultivating leaders who have a world view that recognizes that all lives uh, certainly are lives that black lives matter cultivating a world view that it has to matter, not just in politics, but in policy as well. Uh, and so with that, we have to see ourselves as empowered owners of a nation. Uh, and, uh, and certainly we have to actually view ourselves as being worth, worthy of leading this country, worthy of powering every aspect of it. Let me just give you one last story before I head into my close. And a couple of weeks ago, I was at a wedding, a friend of mine got married um, and she, uh, she's an HBC, HBCU graduate and her uh, husband is an HBCU graduate. So I was at a table with all these HBCU graduates and certainly all of them were African-American. Uh, and, um, you know, I told them that, you know, these ARPA dollars, the American Rescue Plan dollars that came in down the pike as a result of uh, the coronavirus uh, and the COVID epidemic, uh, you know, had has, I mean, we've got unprecedented billions of dollars that are flowing to states and localities right now. Half of the ARPA dollars have already been uh, released. Uh, the other half uh, are being released. And the question is, is, what are they going to do to make sure that our communities are getting uh, the resources we need in an equitable fashion. Uh, communities that have been under-resourced for so long that look the way they do because they have been basically marginalized and sidelined 
uh, communities, not just the infrastructure, but the people investing in black and brown and low income people and families. Uh, you know, this has to be the moment where we do that. And they're not gonna just give it to us. We actually have to demand it. And that means that we have to get organized. And I'm pleased to be working on an, uh, an initiative right now to try to organize people across the country on this uh, in cities across the country as we speak. But one brother across the table said, who lives in Texas, he said, they're not gonna let us do that. And I was, what do you mean they? They're not gonna let us do that. And so, you know, the mentality that, you know, that we're sitting at someone else's table and we have to seek their permission in order to raise our voices to get what we deserve is one that we've got to get rid of. We've got to bury it. Again, we've got to view ourselves as owners, self-determined owners, empowered owners, ones who are willing to actually go toe to toe to do the battle. Latasha, uh, certainly Stacy, uh, certainly, you know, all of these other uh, awesome advocates around the country who are going toe to toe to do the battle. But we've got to change our mindsets as well. And so, you know, a vision of a Black future also means cultural dominance, that we are populating the areas that we need to populate to creating the images that we need to create in Hollywood and elsewhere, uh, Atlanta and elsewhere, to make sure that we're seeing ourselves not just uh, as empowered actors in this uh, enterprise called the United States of America, but in every aspect of our lived experience that we're seeing ourselves. So with that, I had the privilege of asking a group of very accomplished uh, Black folks, not just African-Americans from the United States, but from the diaspora, what is your vision for a liberated Black future? And this is what they gave me. All Black people have their basic needs covered with wealth, jobs, good income, peace and nonviolence are prevalent, and our influence is pervasive. We are over-indexed on home ownership and business ownership. We have intergenerational economic impact that's 100 times the size of our population. We mm. are powerful. We are a powerful community to be reckoned with. We have key leadership positions. We're at every table across every sector of influence. We are engaged and mobilized citizens with a global footprint, not national, global footprint. We have changed the social determinants of health so that we are living enhanced qualities of life, uh, have an enhanced quality of life and increased longevity. We control the present by controlling the past and the future. That is our liberated black futures. Thank you so much. I invite everyone to please join me in uh, thanking Dr. Rocky Moore Cummings, um, putting comments in the chat. Um, we'll just have a pause here so that she can receive all of that appreciation. Thank you so much for your words and your kindness to us. Thank you for having me. It's just definitely my pleasure to be here. And thanks, oh, I'm glad to see people were out there. <laughs> I wasn't sure. <laughs> But anyway, it's my ple pleasure. Um, I don't believe that we take Q and A, so I, I'm happy. Yeah, to yeah. we're, we're gonna move. We'll we'll move on. Thank you very very much, and we appreciate you and sending you so much love. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Mm -hmm. So we are now trans uh, transitioning into uh, the part of the program that will be helmed by our vice president, Dr. Emmett Riley, um, who has led our awards committee. And he'll begin with just uh, an acknowledgement to all of our awards committee members and then share all of those great awards. And then we'll hear about a brand new award from Dr. Elsie Scott.
All right, good evening, INCOBS members, and thank you to our speaker. On behalf of the president of the National Conference of Black Political Scientists, our executive director, members of the executive council, and members of the organization everywhere, we would like to honor our speaker with special recognition this evening. So INCOBS members, if we were in the room, we would all be standing clapping. So light up the chats, letting our speaker know that we appreciate her presence and her words today. As she reminded us, as so many of you have before, that we must continue to uplift the work of Black liberation. And so we will have a plaque in the mail to you uh, commemorating our 53rd annual meeting. And we appreciate you spending time with us today. Let's give a round of applause. Next, before we move on, we have spent this week um, with an incredible conference. Uh, and this took a lot of planning. And so at this time, we wanna also recognize our program chairs, Dr. Corey Gooding uh, and uh, Dr. Davin Phoenix as well for their service in making certain that this program has been a success. This has been an incredible amount of work. This has taken an incredible amount of your time. And we know that time is one of the most precious gifts that you can give to us. And so we appreciate all of your incredible labor. Our words are inadequate. Uh, for the incredible work that you've done during this very interesting moment, and we certainly appreciate you as well. This program would also not be possible without the work of our local arrangement uh, committee. Uh, that includes Dr. Tamlin Tucker Ward. We appreciate your service as well, uh, handling the local arrangements committee. Again, as I can't thank people enough for the work that you guys have done and uh, making certain that we've had an incredible conference this year. And so we certainly are indebted to you and we appreciate you. We also want to recognize our other uh, co-chair of the Local Arrangements Committee, Dr. Jasmine Yarish as well. Thank you for your incredible labor and your incredible work uh, and dedication to this organization as well. Uh, before moving on to other award categories, I wanna take this opportunity to recognize our members. If you are a member and you've recently been promoted to full professor, you've recently earned tenure, you've recently taken on an administrative position, you've recently discovered a new data set that's gonna help get your research off the ground, congratulations to you as well. Many of us occupy spaces on white campuses and we're oftentimes marginalized in those spaces and INCOPES has always been a community to embrace and, uh, and reinvigorate our capacities to get through the academic year. So we wanna take this opportunity as well to recognize each of you. We could, there are so many people who work behind the scenes to make certain that a lot of the administrative work that we, uh, that we do get done. And so uh, Ms. Margaret Clark has uh, been amazing uh, support for us and helping us to get things done. And we also want to take this opportunity to thank you for your incredible labor, that all the things that you do behind the scenes, the calls that you take, the emails that you've been tagged into, and you go the extra mile to make certain that the organization uh, it, it, it continues to operate. And we appreciate you as well. And finally, last but not least, we would not be an organization without the hard work of our incredible executive director, Dr. Kathy Stromau Golden. And so we want to thank you for all of your hard, all of your years of labor uh, that you do to make certain that we do what we need to do. Thank you for correcting us. Thank you for getting us together. Thank you for uh, leading us. And we could, we are, we're just so fortunate to have you uh, have someone like you who is incredibly dedicated to this organization. Uh, I, un I finally understand as, 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 as part of the administration now, your reports that you give us every year. And I definitely appreciate that as well. Um, none of this, uh, at this time, I want to invite Dr. Kathy Stromau Golden to present our next award. And after that, I'll return to go through the rest of the category. So Dr. Golden, please come forward. I'm here, I was asked a question. <laughs> so I, I have the pleasure of presenting the Lena Harris Stromile Student Leadership Award. Uh, Lena Harris Stromile is my mother. She will be 91 years young next month and she's still very feisty. 
So this award is presented to Razia Hillary for demonstrated involvement in community service and social justice. The committee notes, she's the president of the Black Student Union, a multicultural men mentor for the Diversity Center and the co-team director for Delight College Ministries. She's also completed three internships, participated in the Wrangell International Affairs Program and is currently in New York this semester where she will intern with the permanent mission of the Dominican Republic to the United Nations. Her activities demonstrate her willingness to break down the barriers that exist in PWIs. She found her space at Butler and worked to create a better environment for those students who attend the university. Razia is a senior and she has a triple major, political science, international studies, and Spanish at Butler University. Throughout college, she has researched numerous topics and excelled in the classroom. Outside of class, Razia works to improve the lives of others in the Butler and Indianapolis community as the president of Butler's Black Student Union, the team director of Delight College Ministries and the grassroots efforts director of Black Women in, Char in Charge. As a true public servant, she has worked with Catholic Charities, Refugee and Immigration Services, the Office of the Indianapolis Mayor and with the Dominican Republic's permanent mission to the United Nations. She currently serves as an intern with the United Nations Secretariat to promote sustainable development. In the future, she hopes to work in government or international organizations to improve the lives of marginalized community. Razia proudly calls Indianapolis, Indiana her home. Congratulations, and I think you are um, an excellent representative of the uh, spirit of Lena Harris Stromile. The next award that we will be presenting is entitled the Sammy Young Best Student Paper Award. Uh, but before I do that, I want to uh, recognize my committee because none of the giving out these awards would be impossible without the hard work of so many scholars that I've harassed and contacted over the past couple of months to serve as chairs of the various committees. So I want to thank Dr. Samuel, uh, Dr. Albert Samuel, Dr. Kanisha Grant, Dr. Brandon Davis, Dr. Ravi Perry, Dr. Naja Baptiste, Dr. Princess Williams, Dr. Jamie Swift, Dr. Desiree Malonis, Dr. Yemi Cotter, Dr. Kalila Brown-Dean, Dr. Clarissa Peterson, Dr. Michael K. Frontry, and Dr. Uh, Tiffany willoughby Harar. But back to the first award that I was getting ready to present, which is the uh, Sammy Young Best Student Paper Award. This award goes to Claire B. Crawford. Uh, the committee notes that uh, the committee notes that we have not seen such a compelling ethnographic study of lived experiences. Unlike Scott Crawford's work, which is entitled, We Will Never Turn Back, singing songs of freedom. Crawford gives a sonic tour of Black identity. Her work serves as a timely reminder of the important role of Black art, spirituality, and expressions has played in cultivating Black strength, Black survival, resilience, and resistance. She also provides a fresh, a fresh perspective in the matrix between Black politics and culture. Claire is a native of Lithonia, Georgia. She's a fourth year PhD student at the University of Southern California in political science and international relations. She earned a bachelor's of arts degree in international affairs and Africana studies from George Washington University and an MA in conflict resolution from Georgetown University. Let's give a round of applause for the Sammy Young Best Student Paper Award. Ms. Claire B. Crawford. Our next award is the Bayard Rustin LGBTQ Plus Best Student Paper Award. And this award is presented to Isabella Flex Gonzalez. 
uh, for demonstrated excellence in research and promise research that centers the experiences and realities of uh, LGBTQ plus members. The paper is entitled Breaking the Binary, Break Blake Breakington's Transmedicalism and Agnostic Differences of Racial Capitalism. Isabella is a PhD candidate in the Department of Political Science and a graduate femini feminist emphasis student in the Department of Gender and Sexuality Studies at the University of California. Isabella's dissertation, and if the world should end tonight, racial capitalism, sexual myth-making, and Tumblr's queer of color worlds of resistance examined the ways in which race and sexuality are deeply interlinked through projects of racial and sexual myth-making the limitations of and appeals made by mainstream gay and trans politics and how digital platforms functions as a space of refuge and flight for the subject made of multi multiply marginal marginalized. Our next award is the Rodney Higgins Best Faculty Paper Award. This award is presented to Dr. Sally Nima for her, your paper entitled Public Perceptions of Black Girls and Punitive Consequences. The committee notes in selecting this paper, public perceptions of black girls and punitive consequences examines how racial gender stereotypes about black girls lead to greater public support for more punitive punishments of black girls. The data illustrates the empirical links between adultification of black girls and public support for their punishment. In particular, black girls are seen as older, more dangerous, and more knowledgeable about sex than white girls. Thus, they are seen as more responsible for the actions and thus deserving harsher punishments than their peers. It is fascinating to read this work that adds to our understanding about the punitive experiences of Black girls and its broader implications with respect to the current debates about criminal justice reform. Dr. Nima explores issues of race, gender, and public policy and political behavior in US politics in Africa. She completed a PhD in political science at Northwestern University in June of 2016, and currently serves as an assistant professor of urban politics, human development, and social policy and political science at Northwestern University. She has published several articles, including journals such as Perspectives in Politics, Urban Affairs, the Journal of Politics, Groups, Politics, and Identity, just to name a few. Our next award is the Fannie Lou Hamer Outstanding Community Service Award. This award is presented to Dr. Valeria Sinclair Chatton. Uh, the committee notes in selecting Dr. Valeria Sinclair Chatton for this award that she has had a longstanding positive influence in the community she calls home, in her department, and the university community. And the broader professional political science in particular, she has made a, has had a significant impact. Dr. Valeria Sinclair Chapman is an associate professor of political science at Purdue University. She is co-author of Countervailing Forces in African American Political Activism, 1973 to 1994. The book uses group level data to argue that poor and less educated African Americans who are more often victims of crime are often seen as less, less likely to be politically active than wealthy Americans. In addition to her book and journal articles published in se across several forums, Sinclair Chapman has also published on diversity and inclusion in political science. She's also the director for the Center of Research on Diversity and Inclusion at Purdue University. She's also contributed analysis to news outlets on topics ranging from minority political participation in America. She's a member of the editorial leadership for the American Political Science Review, which is the most selective journal in political science. And she is also co-led as editor of group of politics groups and identities, and has been a president of major president of major caucuses within the larger profession of the organization. Our next award goes to the Teacher of the Year. This award is entitled the Anna Julia Cooper Teacher of the Year Award. This award is presented to Dr. Nadia E. Brown for demonstrated excellence in teaching, advising, and mentoring. The committee notes in selecting this candidate. Throughout her academic career, Nadia has taught across disciplines, initially African-American studies and political science, and now women, gender, and sexuality studies and political science. Nadia exceeds at teaching both undergrad and graduate students, and not only does she engage in traditional approaches, lectures, and guide students in linear fashions through time or a set of ideas, 
but she also sees herself as a participant along with students in her classes, where she learns as much from them as they do from her. Nadia is an expert in women's politics, legislative politics, and qualitative methods. Nadia earned a PhD from Rutgers and is a professor of government and chair of women's gender and sexuality studies and, African -American, and is affiliated with the African American Studies Program at Georgetown University. She is also the lead editor for Politics, Groups, and Identity, a journal of Western Political Science Association. Dr. Brown is a founding board member of Women Also Know Stuff. She is also one of the American politics editors at the Monkey Cage. Let's give it up for Dr. Brown. Our next award is the Alex Willingham Best Political Theory Paper presented to Dr. Huda M. Ziki for demonstrated excellence in scholarship and contributions to political science. The committee notes in selecting this paper, Egypt in the Political Imagination of Shirley Graham DuBose. Egypt in the Political Imagination of Shirley Graham DuBose, in selecting your paper, the committee notes the following. This piece illuminates how we might critically reimagine aspects of Shirley Graham DeVos life and work to apprehend better the formation of third world struggles in the mid 21st century in a way that centers black women's internationalism. Dr. Zika is a professor emeriti of political science and Africa, Afri African American studies at Hood College where she established the African American Studies Program and a minor in nonprofit and civic engagement studies. She received a PhD from Atlanta University, where she focused on 20th century science fiction. She has since published on science fiction, race, and women in politics. Her book on mid-20th century civil rights theory, Civil Rights and the Politics at Hampton Institute 2007, described politics at a private Black college in the mid-20th century as its leaders battled segregation in Virginia and nationally. She has written on the connections between African and African-American political thought, global movements to end all forms of discrimination, and the connections between nonviolent movements for social justice in Africa, Asia, the Middle East, and the United States. Our next award is the W.E.B. Du Bois Book Award, which goes to Dr. Nicole Alexander Floyd for her pioneering work, Reimagining Black Women, a Critique of Post-Feminist and Post-Racial Melodrama in Culture and Politics. The committee notes that Reimagining Black Women, a Critique of Post-Feminist and Post-Racial Melodrama in Culture and Politics is a pioneering work that centers, the, that centers African American feminist scholars, many of whom are NCOP members. And reading the description of the book as follows, the book is a wide ranging black feminist interrogation reaching from the Me Too movement to the legacy of gender-based violence against black women. From Michelle Obama to Condoleezza Rice, black women are uniquely scrutinized in the public eye. In Reimagining Black Women, Nicole Alexander Floyd explores how black women and blackness more broadly are understood in our political imagination and often becomes the subject of public controversy. Drawing on politics, popular culture, psychoanalysis, and more, Alexander Floyd examines our conflicting ideas and opinions and narratives about black women, showing how they are equally revered and revealed in the embodiment of good work cast either as victims, villains, citizens, or outsiders. Ultimately, Alexander Floyd showcases the complex, ex complex experiences of Black women as political subjects. At a time of extreme racial tension, reimagining Black women provides insight into the past that Black women's and the parts that Black women play and are expected to play in politics and popular culture. Dr. Nicole Alexander Floyd is a professor of political science at Rutgers University. She's a lawyer and a political scientist and has been actively engaged in a wide range of legal studies. An interdisciplinary and interpretive scholar, her work crosses the field of public law, American politics, and political theory. She's the author of Race and Gender and Nationalism in Contemporary Black Politics, and of course, the, the Reimagining Black Women, a Critique of Post-Feminist and Post-Racial Melodrama in Culture. She's also co-edited with Julia Zachary Jordan of Black Women in Politics, Demanding Citizenship, Challenging Power, and Seeking Justice. Her articles have appeared in leading journal in leading gender studies and political science journals, such as Feminist Formations, International Journal of Africa, Africana Studies, Frontiers, a journal of women's studies, and so much more. 
Let's give a round of applause for all of our award winners this evening. At this time, I would like to invite the legendary Dr. Elsie Scott to the stage to conduct a presentation as well. Congratulations to all our award winners. Good evening, everybody. I'm sorry I have to be the last person to stop you from going to uh, have some, a drink or whatever this evening, but uh, we want to take a little bit of time to recognize a new award we had this year. Thanks to a contribution from the Democracy Fund, we were able to sponsor a competition where uh, we invited students from throughout the country, graduate and undergraduate students, to participate in a contest to write a paper on the continuity of democracy. And we are very pleased that we had both graduates and undergraduates to participate. I want to thank uh, our president, Dr. Tiffany Willoughby Harrod, for all the work she put in, our executive director, Kathy, Dr. Kathy Golden, for helping to get this set up, and our wonderful judges who helped us to go through these papers and to come up with the awardees. So, some of you got a chance to hear uh, our two gra great outstanding graduate students and our undergraduate winner to, uh, this week when we had a presentation of their papers. But just to recognize them again tonight, we want to, uh, to call their names that uh, the runner up for the undergraduate award was Dr. Oh, how did she get to be doctor? She's an undergrad. She's a, she's a senior at uh, St. Michael's College. Uh, her name is uh, Miss uh, Yamuna Turco. And the winner of our undergraduate paper, and I think she's on the line tonight, is not doctor. She's aspiring to be a doctor. She's a senior also from the University of California, Santa Barbara, uh, Miss Acuna Shilela, Shilaka, I'm sorry. And uh, we look forward to them becoming doctors soon when they start graduate programs. And our two very outstanding graduate students who presented their papers, and some of you got a chance to hear them, and those of you didn't, you can go and watch them on YouTube once the YouTube uh, uh, panels are put online. But we had uh, Jalen, Campbell, who's a PhD student at Temple University, and Kara McRae, who's a PhD student at Brown University. So we want to say congratulations to all of them and welcome to the profession. We look forward to you taking our places at some point. Uh, thank you very much for everybody who helped with this. It was a, it was a lot of work, but it was a labor of love and hopefully the Democracy Fund. I hope somebody from the Democracy Fund is watching tonight and hope that they will see fit to join us again in these outstanding awards. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Scott and Dr. Riley and Dr. Golden for sharing all that wonderful, incredible good news um, and the possibility of just being able to honor um, each other. I want to also thank uh, Pi Sigma Alpha and their support for the Sammy Young Award and the Lena Harris Stromile Award. It's wonderful when other organizations come to you and want to contribute because they see that what you're doing is, um, is what's needed and is the most powerful and visionary thing possible for students in political science. Um, so we thank them for that support. We'll have our closing remarks now from our program chairs, Davin Phoenix and Corey Gooding. And um, so delighted for everyone that has contributed to the conference thus far. And we will uh, see you tomorrow, Davin and Corey. Yes, yeah, so we want to um, just take 20 to 30 more minutes. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> 20, 30 more seconds 
to congratulate once again all of our winners. I'm just bursting. There's so many wonderful people. It's just such a great reminder of how rich this community is in this current moment and in the future with so many emerging scholars are producing such amazing work. So to all of those who are um, recognized, we thank you for your work and your teaching and your mentorship and your service. We just want to highlight that we hope you can be present for a number of the remaining panels we have tomorrow. We have some great professional development uh, panels. We of course have the uh, HBCU faculty panel, the Founders Symposium, and of course the inauguration where you get one more opportunity to thank and just spread so much love to Madam President Willoughby Harrard for guiding us and shepherding us through this most challenging time and to celebrate and lend our support to Dr. Riley as he prepares to take on the mantle of president. So it's been a real honor to be a part of this uh, event and this conference. And just speaking on behalf of Dr. Gooding myself, we thank you all because we know NCOPES is only as strong as we make it. So as we stand at this crossroads, we look forward to a future for us tonight of rest and celebration and a good night's sleep so we can come back tomorrow and finish strong. Uh, we appreciate you all and we'll see you all tomorrow. Take care.